opioids and addictive pain medication in the status quo kill hundreds of thousands of people in the world. Side affirmative will kill, sorry, save their lives and therefore win. Four points are set up to begin this speech. Firstly, obviously the motion assumes feasibility, which presumes that it is possible to objectively determine the experience and degree of pain for these individuals and for those who are going to doctors, for example. And notice, uh, notably, there are factors which exist that that will mean that this objective calculus is going to be determined in a good way. Secondly, we will note that the pressure of bodies of academic literature are likely to exist around this research. Why? Firstly, there are pharmaceutical incentives to engage in this research to further their pain medication in a way that is efficacious so they can maximize the profit incentives. Secondly, obviously government has a significant revealed incentive to fund these things, but also have, you know, uh, populist incentives to make sure that this research is done well. And thirdly, there's probably sufficient medical bodies which also have revealed incentives to do this in a way that is uh, like uh, done well and also explore all of the facets of this research and get into all of the rooks and queries and all of that. That obviously exists in the status quo. Third piece of setup in regards to the application of this restriction. Obviously, there exists a spectrum of different types of uh, pain medication in the status quo and the range of how they are addictive. We would obviously apply this to forms of uh, medication that are severely addictive, i.e. morphine and opioids, this doesn't apply to things that are non-addictive and exist over the counter in most uh, countries, i.e. Panadol, and therefore applies also to things that are chronic addiction, uh, chronic, chronic conditions which are incredibly, incredibly painful. Fourth piece of setup is just to explain the, uh, the difference between side affirmative's world and side negative's world and what this prescription process looks like. Under side negative in the status quo, this pain scale exists on one to 10, which is to say this is often and entirely based on the response and the prescription and the perspective of the, uh, like the victim or the guy that's going to the doctor and then the doctor prescribes as a result of that. On the side affirmative, we would have scientific literature to some extent which exists. We would have some form of regulation of what is correct or applicable or relevant to the specific symptoms, to the specific ailment that these people are presenting with and therefore prescribe through that. Uh, as a result. Two uh, very basic arguments, uh, I guess one if I have time. Firstly, in regards to how we solve the opioid epidemic in regards to addiction. Two things I'm going to prove under this. Firstly, why this problem exists within the status quo. Secondly, how we fix this problem. Three reasons why this problem exists in the status quo. Firstly, in regards to opioid medication, we would note it's functionally addictive insofar as like the chemical like foundation of it means that your brain and your, uh, I guess, your chemical systems become dependent on these things, which means there are a significant set of side effects which exist as a result of this opioid. And there are some instances where this is necessary, i.e. some people are, incredible, are in incredible amounts of pain and therefore require this like access to all points. But there are also many instances where this is overprescribed and often not sufficient and often is outweighed insofar as these opioids have a set amount of side effects and are obviously quite addictive at the point at which you are overprescribing this that obviously has a set of harms. And secondly, we would explain that this is massively overprescribed in the status quo empirically. Why is this the case? Firstly, was, uh, patients in the status quo are fundamentally incapable of effectively expressing the pain that they're in. Why is this true? Firstly, the scale in the status quo is like absolutely tragic. When I went to see John, it's this Literally one to ten, use your imagination. What is the best possible or most painful like way that you can experience this? Or they give people who are like kids or non-illiterate in the language of the thing like faces to point out that is incredibly, incredibly like arbitrary and incredibly, incredibly up to the discretion of the individual, which means they are very likely to be prone to a set of uh, psychological frameworks. What do those psychological frames look, look like? Obviously, every single individual is pain adverse. So to the extent which you are experiencing pain, you want to get rid of that pain as much as possible. So you're likely to overshoot the pain that you were experiencing in order to make sure you don't feel that pain. Because in the counterfactual, you would be still experiencing that pain, obviously quite bad. But also, we would often, uh, we would push that pain is often self-realizing to the extent where you expect that you're gonna feel a lot of pain. That actually is more pain than you would have like felt otherwise. It's the same with anxiety. If you expect yourself to be anxious, you'd be more anxious than you actually would have been otherwise. That just means that patients in the status quo are horrible at doing this, even from revealed, uh, like I guess, past experiences. Second reason why this is likely to be um, particularly bad. Obviously, doctors have structural and just like personal incentives to do these in a way to sell these to patients. Why? Firstly, there are often financial incentives in regards to the agreeable of needs. That is to say, you want repeat customers coming back to your clinic at the point at which you make it far more difficult for these clients and these patients to get medication off you at the point at which you are less agreeable to them. Obviously, they choose to go to another doctor. Secondly, uh, there's often rating and feedback systems that exist in things like America, where this is often determinative to your clientele, to the people who are likely to visit you. And this obviously is prone like or controlled by the patient to the extent where they control all of the feedback mechanisms. If they dislike you or if you don't give them drugs, obviously they're going to give you bad feedback. That's an incentive for doctors to overprescribe. And that also 
means that you are far more likely to prescribe arbitrarily. Why is this the case? Uh, because, thirdly, there's just massive pharma lobbying in the status quo, which is to say, often they give direct financial comp compensation to these di uh, doctors directly, i.e. like Purdue and oxytocin, uh, literally just pay doctors to overprescribe these, uh, uh, these medicines. Uh, next reason, because uh, they explicitly some just pill mills, that is to say, there are doctors who are known within industry, known within certain uh, locations and within certain communities to be just basically dispensaries for pain medication. And that is to explain, it is incredibly difficult to regulate this in the status quo to the extent where pain is subjective, to the extent where patients are just saying, I'm in a lot of pain, you should give me this pain, or, they, or give me this pain medication, or they will go to alternatives. On the side, affirmative, we uniquely fix this. Why is it that we fix this problem? Firstly, because obviously there's an objective determinant on the outside of the house, which means that the prescription is just fundamentally of necessity, which is to say it is only to the extent to which you are actually and objectively experience this pain within the empirical research. And that means you have doctors who are in good who are potentially good actors in the status quo because you know principally they're like aligned with these things and you know they have the moral code that they align with. That just means they do a job their job better. That means when they're sympathetic to their patients they can strive in ways that are very, very good for them. That means they're likely to explore that research and do it in a way that is efficacious. But for those who are bad actors which do exist in the status quo, unfortunately those uh, I guess bad actors have a, for a mechanism of enforcement, have a mechanism of accountability which is to say at the point at which you have records of these conditions of the symptoms when someone comes to you with chronic pain and things like that, you can point to the literature, you force these doctors to look at that, res uh, that research and that literature and prescribe pain medication off that, rather than just give out opioids and addictive medication willy and nilly. What are the massive impacts of this? Firstly, and quite obviously, you just prevent the massive amounts of death in, in the status quo, which are oh, very regrettable, entirely preventable on the side of thermidity. Secondly, we just explained that those who do not require opioids in the status quo, i.e. those people who are being overprescribed or being shot up or like pushed into using opioids, no longer have to sustain the harms of these medications. That is to say, they're far more likely to be offered far more placated forms of medication, far better, like far more um, uh, choices given to them. Obviously, those alternatives are probably far less addictive, far less harmful in the status quo. Uh, thirdly, in terms of the impact, we just explained there are many, many jurisdictions in the status quo that have overreacted and overproportionately balanced to this uh, opioid crisis. That is to say, it is often overregulated and incredibly act, like, difficult to access due to crackdowns in the structures, which is to say, they no longer have any form of access to opioids or pain medication fundamentally is incredibly difficult to act, uh, access, which means we necessarily need to go to straight alternatives, things like fentanyl, things like weed which are obviously far better than you know things that you know pharmaceuticals are offering and we're putting through labs and testing which just means we far more objectively benefit those individuals far more beneficially uh, in, like beneficialize these people and deprive them of an unimaginable amount of harm and improve the quality of life just going to finish this speech with some mechanisms for why this research is likely to be inclusive, likely to be accountable. Firstly, because there's probably broad interest in this at the point at which medical priority of this is probably going to be relatively high, given that like medicine entirely is predicated on the health of the patient. Obviously, at the point where you reduce that pain, that is a high incentive. Secondly, there are bodies that exist in the status quo, like the FDA, which require and necessitate research coverage across a different set of people, and that trial accru uh, accrues across a broad range of like subsets and stakeholders and things like that. Thirdly, you have norms and movements in the status quo, like feminists and minority representatives, that will give you a lot of push uh, and like incentives to do these things well. And fourthly, there is scrutiny, there are revealed incentives. So far to affirm, we save hundreds of thousands of lives. So a few pieces of setup of what it looks like on our side, how like their claim of solving the opioid crisis is completely ridiculous and how it actually gets worse on their side. Two pieces of substantive about a principled practical benefit on our side of how AF actually like wants people like increases the amount of pain that patients will actually have to suffer, and then also how they reduce the engagement in medical facilities. Okay. First of all, some pieces of setup. So first of all, I wanted to recharacterize what our side looks like. Because then they were like, oh yeah, one to ten things. Like, just use your imagination. Do what you want to, like, do what you want. Tell your doctor what you want. We think this is, like, not what we stand for. First of all, the motion calls for some form of feasibility, right? Their characterization is completely uncharitable. And our side, we see it working like it does a lot in GPs today, right? Your GP gives you a certain thing, and you go like, oh yeah, is this working? Come back in a week. Your doctor calls you, checks that it's working. If it's not, then come back for more, for a higher dosage. We think on the our side, this is probably what it looks like. Not like one to ten. Ten. Okay, here's fentanyl. That's not how it works on the left side, on the outside. Okay, second of all, when people, I also wanted to characterize how pain works for different types of people, right? First of all, people experience pain completely differently, especially when they undergo surgery, especially when they have like a graze on their knee. Some people think that the, like the, knee, the knee graze hurts a lot, some people don't. And also, two reasons. 
like um, two different stakeholders that we're talking about. People like who um, find it like it takes a while for medication to kick in or have different depth perceptions, and also people who live with pain in the first place. Things like arthritis, things like long-term conditions. In our world, it looks like your doctor asking, how much pain are you in, right? Based on their experience, they give you a certain amount of meds, based on their experience, and then they come back in a week and they say, are these working? They recalibrate upon response. Okay, the comparative under their side is literally go to your doctor and they like, give you like a certain amount and you're like, oh wait, I'm still feeling a lot of pain, I'm still feeling like not good at all. And they just go like, okay, sorry, these studies are right. And this is a necessary burden on their side where they ignore the entire perspective of the patient, where pain does not matter to them, where they are like, oh yeah, you, you suffer pain, there's nothing we can do about it. We think that this is also especially bad because studies occur in clinical environments where pain is definitely perceived differently when you're in an environment where you're like interacting with a lot of people, pain is perceived completely differently. It is a mental thing, not something that is clinical something that can be quantified okay also we think that there are a lot of problems with these studies and i'll go into this now a lot of these studies are a um they are from explicit bias, like they contain explicit bias a lot of these were performed a lot of medical research that we have today is from for example unit 731 or nazi germany we get a lot of this stuff from world war ii because you don't just cut open people anymore these days that happens a lot in world war ii and because of this this means that certain people that you're tested on are asian are german are eurocentric right a lot of these um, this means that like for African Americans, for example, a lot of medical research is still under, under like dated, still like really, really far back. Also, second of all, it, con it contains implicit bias, right? Because, all, like, for example, a lot of these studies were only occurred on men because women like were carrying babies, and also because a lot of them were POWs, and usually these were men. Third of all, a lot of these occurred on college age students. For example, the COVID vaccine only probably occurred uh, and was tested on people who were 18 to 21 because these were the people who volunteered their health and probably could survive the COVID vaccine, right? Okay, so this means that these tests are probably predominantly occurring in white countries or in certain races. And second of all, probably located in the first world because these are the places where these institutions exist to, and have enough money to do these things. Also, third of all, we think a big problem with these studies is that it probably takes a really long time to correct these studies. Why? This is for three main reasons. First of all, because you're probably not going to be believed, right? You're a small minority, and minorities are usually not likely to like, speak out on huge like, vaccine problems, for example, saying that like, P-Pfizer is completely useless. Second of all, like, obviously, sorry, clarify it's not, but like, yeah, okay. Um, second of all, you're probably, it's really hard for you not to like, know that you're only one. For example, when you get prescribed Rakuten, a big side effect is mood swings and mental things. I went to the doctor, and when I said that I had mood swings and like big mental like, um, things from like, uh, for example, like this sort of stuff, the doctor just says, oh, it's probably from external factors. They're unlikely to actually blame the medication on the side effect, especially when they're mental, and they can be occurred by a vast majority of factors. We think, third of all, a lot of doctors are also under, like, Un, um, are unincentivized from actually going complaining to the company because the science is settled. There's this idea that like lots of studies were like conducted. Why do like one people or a few minority of people coming up and saying their side effects actually matter when they're like these clinical ideas that like this is fact, this is how it works. Okay, to address their points on the solving the opioid crisis, the opioid crisis occurred because Sackler made bad studies, because Sackler was corrupt, and because they made these studies and informed doctors badly. Not because patients went and then just asked for opioids. These, this, like the exact side they stand for is the exact problem, right? Because the opioid crisis created bad studies. This is what it looks like under the, their world. And this also looks like when bad studies are conducted, the harms are huge. Marginal, small, bad studies create massive impacts across the world because that's all that the world relies on. Second of all, we also weigh the fact, um, yeah, yeah, also we think that when they underprescribe opioids or underprescribe these things, because of these studies, people turn to illegal drugs, people turn to like self-medication through drugs and alcohol, people turn to the actual harmful substances, such as fentanyl, because doctors didn't prescribe them properly because of these studies. This is where the harm occurs, not when doctors prescribe you like bad things, because doctors will not prescribe you cocaine. We want to be very, very clear on this. And also, Sackler is very exclusive to the US because big pharma lobbying only occurs there pretty much, and it's a very, very limited example. Okay, now to my two points of substantive. Okay, first of all, what's it a frame? Pain is obviously individual. I think I've done a lot of setup on this because first of all, like, um, and also we think that the guidelines of the studies are likely to be extremely conservative for safety and legal reasons because obviously like if you make a really high dosage thing and you're like, and then a bunch of people die, that sucks for your company. Also, second, um, yeah, yeah. So because we know that pain is individual and these guidelines are probably going to be bad, this, um, we also know pain is individual for two main reasons. First of all, because for women, um, obviously I don't know, but I've heard that period cramps are very different between different women. And also second of all, because people have different pain thresholds, right? Because rugby players can take a hit, unlike me who plays volleyball. Third of all, <laughs> for different, um, for, um, people also have different compounding factors, right? Like doctors may not be aware of certain things that patients undergo and also pain probably don't think that they're actually relevant, right? So a lot of information is actually hidden and they don't actually know about it that patients only can experience. 
Okay, what does this mean? People are more likely to suffer pain. This looks like probably under-prescription. Also, I want to weigh the fact that under-prescription is the biggest problem in this debate because this is where pain occurs. Over-prescription, yes, is bad, but nowhere as bad as the pain that like, patients will suffer when they're under-prescribed. And we think that under-prescription happens so much more under their side because these studies, as I already said, are probably low-end, probably conservative, probably not prescribing them the right amount and for a, month, like a bunch of reasons. Also, second of all, it invalidates personal pain, which we think that this will compound and lead to less engagement with the medical facilities that I'll go on to. Because people are probably more distrustful of doctors because they don't care what you're going to say, right? For example, like the idea that women only need a paddle before a pap smear, which is literally like taking tissue from the cervix. This is a myth and like a study that occurred. We think that this is completely ridiculous. This is the bad studies that they stand for under their side. And are probably like, as I already said, when one bad study happens, the entire like, um, system of GPs is affected. Okay, third of all, we think um, overprescribing, yeah, is terrible and occurs under their side. Under prescription and overprescription is a world that they stand for because pain is individual, because pain is different. Okay, what is the importance of this? This means that people are less likely to engage with medical facilities because, number one, people will trust doctors less because doctors don't listen to them. Imagine if you went to your teacher and you asked them a question and the teacher was like, nope, not going to happen, right? Obviously, you're not going to be like, oh, wow, ask them more questions, be more engaging with them. No, obviously, this doesn't occur. People are going to trust doctors less, which means people are probably less likely to go to the GP and probably more likely to turn to things such as homeopathic medicines and self-medication. This is a massive harm under their side. And note that this is cyclical and compounding because once GPs are less likely to be um, oh yeah, because uh, GPs are also less likely to know that they're prescribing poorly because patients don't go to complain to them that like they're still experiencing pain. This is compounding because studies are never corrected and GPs never know, which leads to no change in their status in their when they're well. And obviously, the, um, I'm going to go to the harms of people turning to self-medication because they're either being under-prescribed or over-prescribed. Okay, so people will turn to stronger um, drugs individually when pain continues, and this because uh, they have to judge for themselves because the doctor can't even judge or help them in any way. This is so like these harms are super amplified when it comes to like homeo homeopathy and also um, like like self-medication. We think under their side, we stand for a world where there um, where there's correct prescription and um, opioid crisis exists. Okay, thanks very much for that speech. And now I'd like to welcome the second of our speakers. Despite negative claims, do you have to stand for bad research? But that was simply not true, because the world they defended was the status quo, notably one where much of this research into conditions like chronic pain, like chronophritis, actually just does not exist in the first place. Because why would it? Because there's no incentive to research these things at the point you rely on what a patient tells you of how they feel, and you can just give them medication and their problems go away, irrespective of the harm that is done to patients, irrespective of the damage it does to their lives and to their loved ones. It was only on our side we actually got this research to exist in the first place. That was why we took this debate. I'm going to do three things in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to briefly respond to their very uncharitable setup and explain what they actually have to defend. Secondly, I'm going to explain why the research we get is likely to be good and also why it's going to be particularly diverse, responding directly to the material that they provide there. And finally, I'm going to explain kind of the opioid crisis stuff, responding to some of their analysis and explaining why we actually help that it's privileged far more than David. Let's briefly look at their setup. The main claim I want to deal with here is their conception that people experience pain differently. I want to note that empirical evidence would suggest that pain often is, to a large part, psychologically constructed, something which they never respond to, which means that a lot of pain is perceived rather than actually experienced. I would also note here that obviously these conditions exist on a spectrum, but the actual variance of pain within these conditions is A, relatively small, and B, concentrated between specific groups. So yes, if you're a woman who is like over past menopause, you will 
will experience chronic pain differently to someone who's a dude in his early 20s. But that is the exact type of thing that research is particularly good at accounting for because you understand that there are those differences. And when you cannot rely on subjective experiences of pain, you as a doctor and as pharmaceuticals have maximal incentive in order to ensure that your research is done well, which suggests you would actually target these individual groups because you're not exactly lacking in sample size. The next claim that I will want to respond to is that, oh, well, if these people are in pain after these, if people will be in pain after these medications often, and so you have to deal with under prescription. I simply want to weigh up here the harms of under prescription versus over prescription. Because if you're under prescribed, you, yes, you experience a level of pain, but note it's actually very hard to tell whether or not you've been underscribed medication. Because just because you're in pain after payment does not necessarily suggest that more pain medication is actually the solution. Because oftentimes, the type of pain you experience just cannot be completely negated with pain medication anyway, and so you trying to turn to stronger substances isn't particularly helpful, or at the point it does become helpful, the level of side effects you're exposed to is likely to be particularly damaging to someone who already has a vulnerable health condition, which then suggests their harm under prescription might suck for the comparatively very small amount of people who that it happens to, and no, they do no way to suggest it's a large group of people, but that the harms weeks when an Isaac speech of overprescription, that is to say that people become addicted to substances they cannot get off, that people literally lose their lives and die because of the effects of these drugs and the fact they cannot stop taking because the bliss that pain medication gives you feels so good. That was a drastically higher harm than the one they provided on their side. That was why we swamped the debate on that front. They did have to defend these types of overprescriptions, etc. Let's then look at quality of research. What are the responses they give here? first two responses to say, oh, this research is biased because it exists in the developed world and it's based on biased research. I would note here, most of the things we talk about these are not like Nazi-era studies. Notably, meta-analysis exists. You do other multiple studies on types of conditions. You also do overviews of all of those studies to ensure that they are coming to relatively similar conclusions. This is academic, in, academia in general is relatively good at self-correction, which is an active incentive for you to do so, because if you as an academic can find out that something has done something wrong, that is a revolutionary paper, and that is one that gives you huge plaudits and credit, particularly when it's a long resting assumption, suggesting this simply does not exist. But the second thing I'm going to do here is respond with a piece of standard to literally explain why we get the types of intersectional research they say we don't. And that's because currently in the status quo, as identified in my introduction, particularly when it comes to the experiences of winter and German minorities and racial minorities, it's substantially <laughs> under-researched, this type of research. Why is this the case? One, simply minimal incentive. On their side, you have to listen to subjective experience. So why would you care about things objectively at the point we identify the range of incentives as to why doctors overly cater to patients on their side? It's speech, which again receives zero response. Secondly, it just uses resources, right? These things are expensive. And so at the point there is no incentive, there is unlikely that people would willingly invest a lot of money into this. How do we change this on our side? Very simply, the motion itself creates the impetus. At the point where you want to be doing things on research base as much as possible, you're incredibly likely to just generate demand for this research itself. And secondly, it's because of the fact that an appropriate level of care is no longer determined by the patient, it is determined by research, which means it takes it out of those subjective hands. You need to find academic metrics to draw upon things. You want them to be accurate as possible, because obviously doctors still want like, patients to have a good experience and good treatment, particularly because they claim that doctors really care about you. So that also suggests incentives as to why this research is likely particularly diverse. That suggests then we have a mutually exclusive benefit in this debate, which is that people who experience and people who experience various types of medical conditions who aren't just white cis men actually get researched in this name. We actually understand the ways in which they experience pain from these conditions differently and are able to prescribe medication far more effectively towards those groups to ensure this actually happens. This obviously is just huge improvements on quality of life for a vast majority of people who are in the status quo because of the various biases that exist because of the fact that people assume that women are weak and do not like just have very low pain tolerance and so their pain is illegitimate. The fact that black men should just toughen up because of the fact that they are strong and so in, the, in like substantial amount of pain that, oh, well, they'll be fine, so I don't need to worry about it. That is the type of thing you stop on our side because there is empirical back evidence to suggest it is not the case. I think that blasts their claim of bad research out of the water. The final thing I'm going to respond to here is that to claim that, oh, individuals won't be believed. I don't think it's true that doctors just don't be empathetic to patients anymore because of the fact you're prescribing differently. Obviously, someone's still in pain. It's still pretty awful. But now there is a far more appropriate level of checks that have been going through to ensure that a patient who's not a medical expert and does not know the types of medication that is available or how they work are now likely to be done far, far better on our side. And I'll just throw the comparative here real quickly before I move into this next clash. Because the comparative they suggest is, oh, you try a bunch of different pain medications and you see what is best. Noting as I've already responded to in this speech, that does suggest then that because of that doesn't actually respond to the analysis we give you about what you're likely to want more pain medications to do with any level of pain, even when it's not necessarily helpful, you are likely to still keep asking your doctor for more and more pain medication. But the other thing I would just respond to here, very, very simply, is 
are saying, obviously it's a terrible experience to have to go through that, right? These medications do have side effects to the point you're constantly switching between medications. And note, it's not a week like they suggest. To actually work out that this works, it's often a period of months, which means you often spend a year-long period in order to actually try and get the medication that wrecks your body because you're trying to heaps of different meds, which are very, very drastic in how they operate and often have a large range of side effects, even to the ones that are comparatively lesser. That is a devastating experience. If we can avoid that, that's fucking fantastic. Let's then look at the question of the opioid crisis. They want to claim that, oh, the opioid crisis didn't happen because of patients, because of bad studies. Notably, why does that response not work? Because this debate is not about studies on medication, it's about studies on conditions. When you're generating bad studies about the specific medication you're providing from an internal medical study, that is very different when you're doing independent studies on the actual conditions themselves, which suggests that the mechanism they suggest there simply is not a sufficient response to this argument, proving that this does still occur. The second thing I want to observe is obviously this is not just a America unique problem, right? This research and the pharmaceuticals, which do have large amounts of power, do in fact purvey to a substantial extent on their side. We at least put a boundary in place because now there is an academic level that needs to be met. And notably, that happens an hour before you prescribe this medication, not after, which means if they do the studies on their side and find out this is inappropriate, all the harm is already done. We're prescribing off academia, which suggests this is simply not a problem in the first place. The second claim they make here is that, oh, well, this is just trustful of doctors because they have subjective experiences and patients with the value. One, I would think that's probably not true for the reason I've already identified by doctors being empathetic. But secondly, at the point doctors still care about helping you, they're obviously going to do everything in their power to make sure that is not the case. But finally, I would just actually challenge the claim in the first place, because they never explain to you why a large number of patients are going to be the types of people who suffer through this. Finally, last bit of the substantive, disprivileged actors and how they're particularly helped with our side. Because of the fact doctors are not immune from things like social biases, they often in take these subjective determinants as a pain and use them in such a way which is particularly destructive. Like I explained earlier, how treats men and men, women and men of color. Notably, this leads to women literally passing out in their homes because of the fact they are literally in too much pain and they are not prescribed enough subjectively because doctors do not care for them. That completely is fixed on our side. At the point you have objective standards of pain and through academia, you actually are able to recognize, oh shit, that is a lot of pain and you can actually prescribe appropriate medication. Notably, also vicious supply issues in the developing world, which is there's a limited level of things like opioids. You're now able to allocate those resources far more effectively. Ultimately, if you care about people dying today, about people living in pain, you're far better off in a world in which that was meaningfully enforced properly. Medical professionals can be as empathetic as they like in their world, but they cannot give you extra medication. The reason why Jack's Paps, for example, is so so crucial to this debate is because you can ask but is because despite a woman's demands to have more painkillers, they have to stand for a world in which textbooks and studies dictate the fact that only one panadol is allowed before you get a portion of your cervix cut out of your body. The first thing I want to address um, is some rebuttal against the idea that pain is psychologically prescribed. A couple of responses to this. Firstly, I really want you to consider what Jack talked about in which the nature of these studies in which these prescriptions are based off, firstly, show extreme explicit bias and that there's a lot of medical research performed on slaves that still determine uh, a lot of like the, the um, prescription metrics for African Americans to this day. Those sorts of um, metrics are still being updated. Secondly, the implicit biases in which drugs are often tested on men, often tested on middle class college age volunteers um, and this like predominant um, like white majority in a predominantly like white um, country is irrepresentable of these multicultural um, diverse demographics that live in these worlds where these drugs are being prescribed. This looks like the fact that body mass metrics often don't align between Asian bodies and white bodies yet that's often commonly uh, a mistake perpetuated in the status quo. And a huge impact of that, um, in addition to the ones that Jack has already outlined, is that people turn to self-medication, is that they've um, instead turned to things like alcohol because they've lost faith in doctors, is in the fact that they've turned to illegal drug markets, to, uh, which are often like providing more dangerous, less regulated, stronger drugs um, to deal with the immense pain, the immense suffering that they're under. 
Um, and another push against like this pain being psychologically prescribed and therefore like people are too stupid to like feasibly determine how much medication they need. We'd say that doctors are educated enough to understand when people have like problematic drug seeking behaviour, that they're able to mitigate that. And I'm going to like talk a little bit more on this later. And that thirdly, even in their best case, in which people get like a sort of placebo effect from these prescribed drugs, you're alleviating someone's pain. And I think that's so, so crucial because um, they say like, oh, more pain medication is, is not the solution. Um, we say we're not going to be poisoning these people, we're just going to help them with something that is a huge burden on their lives. Um, okay, so uh, next on their push on how like doctors are really corrupt and they have these personal financial incentives that they're big pharma lobbyists who are like introducing them uh, to like other uh, other like corporate interests on uh, luxurious cruises and they get doctors to overprice their medication. We'd say firstly these, this example, this case like only works really in America um, where like we see this happening and so that's like a pretty uh, minimal um, minimal group of medical professionals um, and secondly we'd say that like um, uh, in terms of like reviews um, for these doctors existing, uh, we'd say that like no like rate my doctor doesn't really exist, and even if it does exist, like the average person is not researching which GP they're going to to like get the best meds. They're likely just going to go to their local GP because it's convenient because they're familiar with them. Um, so we don't think this stands. And next on um, how like the FDA, um, how they say they're saying like oh we're going to get really diverse research regardless because the FDA necessitates this really broad uh, these really broad diverse studies that there are minority advocates that this is going to happen regardless. Um, three responses here. Firstly, that um, this is just empirically not true. COVID vaccines were never tested on women despite just being distributed worldwide. Under the status quo, clearly medical establishments are really uh, like are willing to have these sort of negligences. But secondly, it's really hard to lobby for specific demographics. Um, like in the status quo, I want to like see where the lobbyists are for like better oxycodone uh, prescription for Japanese women or something. Um, please be reasonable here. Thirdly, even if all of this is not true, um, these studies are going to get a, take a really long time to like just see through. Like if every single niche needs to be covered somehow, that's going to take an immense amount of time to see through. And also there's like no fuel to the flame, right? Jack has already said um, that um, if some of the science is already settled and there's like no major dissent, like that's the predominant narrative, then you're going to be want to, you you're going to want to use your research and development resources for something uh, more like crucial to what people like. For example, like finding a cure for certain cancers. Um, and we also say that, like, oh, they've also said that we put people at risk uh, because we, like, have no uh, research basis. We say that, I think it's quite reasonable that we still do base, like, drug safety tests, that, like, the TD50 metric still exists in which we don't prescribe drugs that have, like, a toxic dose um, for over, like, 50% of toxic effects on over 50% of people. Um, but also, we say that, like, we don't need perfect research studies on our side on every single niche in the population because, crucially, like Jack outlined in terms of our model, it's a case by case basis in which we literally satisfy anybody, like everyone going to a medical professional. I think that's so, so important. Okay, um, and now on a substantive push in terms of pregnancies. So, on site affirmative, what they have to stand for is something similar to the status quo in which giving a woman an epidural is um, in pregnancy is an option, but the predominant narrative is that it is a woman's like biological destiny to give birth naturally, and as such, Women, um, women are often like not, uh, uh, women are often like pressured away from or actively not encouraged to seek an epidural despite the immense pain relief it provides, um, unless it's like some sort of last resort. In which case, side affirmative is essentially has, has to stand for um, shaming these women to the point where they feel like, oh, I didn't like achieve my biological prerogative in giving birth properly the way all other women in society have been doing for like centuries and centuries. Um, Side affirmative is seeking to shame these individuals. They're seeking to cling on to that like really conservative view, which is based on these sort of, um, which is based based on these flawed conclusions around um, womanhood. Instead, on our side, what we push is that like pain is relative to individual circumstances. That different pain tolerances, um, that different pain tolerances are valid, like Jack has told you. Um, that. Um, 
that different pa that different pain tolerances are valid. Um, that like you're not a worse woman. You're not like betraying your biological prerogative by taking this last resort painkiller because instead it's going to be something that like every woman because they have individual tolerances dependent on like individual circumstances, extenuating circumstances. Because um, like pain is so relative, um, people are going to just be more willing to take that, and that's just going to raise. Um, that's not only going to significantly lessen. Um, that's not only going to significantly lessen the pain for all women, um, but um, that's like such a huge, huge impact because all women are going through childbirth, which in itself, uh, which itself, uh, but because this is going to lessen potential pain for all women going through childbirth, which itself, like given that almost every woman um, considers childbirth as something that they do in their life, is like such a huge impact. That's literally millions upon millions of individuals uh, throughout the world. Uh, what side affirmative has to stand for is le le leaving people in pain um, despite the fact that people have different tolerances like Jack said, despite the fact that the guidelines in our world are already incredibly conservative, that they're already incredibly Eurocentric, that they're already incredibly biased, um, despite everything they want to pump at you about um, these, like, really diverse, uh, re uh, these really diverse studies. They have to stand for the fact that like, oh no, everybody is standard, that, these, that there are no individual um, that there are no individual responses to pain. We think that's incredibly problematic, um, and we think it's really, really crucial to recognise the complications around people seeking medical aid, to recognise these individual cases, and to value and validate these individuals. I'm so, so proud to negate. Every path the negative team has to victory in this debate relies on you believing that side affirmative is for some reason worse than the status quo of prescribing appropriate pain relief. This would be a weird thing to believe for three reasons. The first thing is, as we explained to you, already doctors frequently ignore what people tell them, such as when women or minorities communicate that they're experiencing pain, the doctors just refuse to believe them. So these people clearly are not being appropriately prescribed. Prescribed. Secondly, we tell you that 200,000 people die every single year from the opioid overdose. Clearly these people were not being prescribed appropriate pain medication. And thirdly, we explain to you that even when doctors are well-intentioned, their capacity to do a good job is severely curtailed by the fact that, for example, patients are just really bad at communicating how much pain they're in to their doctor. Because Describe on a 1 to 10 pain scale how much pain you're in does not actually communicate information because patients have limited reference points from which to describe that pain. They have a bias towards exaggerating that pain if they believe that that is what will get them relief. And yes, obviously you can mitigate that somewhat by saying things like, well, you could try a week of medication and then have them come back in a month once you maybe know the effects and then try again and try again. But one, this concedes that at the very least you're looking at months of lead-in time before you get an appropriate solution. You're hoping that patients choose to stick with that process. Two, you're assuming that doctors are willing to take that amount of time when often they're frequently overworked. And three, you assume that patients don't immediately just push you to prescribe the more severe medications, which is what we explain frequently happens, and we explain doctors frequently cave for the reasons that they want patients to be satisfied, and they don't want, they don't have the resources necessary to push back against those patient demands, because how can you say the patient is wrong? They tell you they're in pain, they're screaming at you, like obviously it feels really bad to deny them medication. On our side, you have the objective research that at least allows you to resist in those circumstances, which is why you do not do so. So the first and really only crucial question to examine in this debate is who better prescribes these drugs? So why will prescriptions be very good on our side? Noting that in order to win, we just need to demonstrate that it's better than status quo. We've explained that burden is on the floor. Several reasons they give you as to why we would do a bad job. Firstly, they say that pain is like deeply subjective and individual, and therefore it would be impossible to have scientific studies that appropriately de determine the amount of pain people experience. Three responses. Firstly, if you read the topic, it does have the word assuming feasibility in it, which I think should grant us at least a bit of leeway towards being able to do this. It's probably very unfair for them to push us particularly hard here. And secondly, we would say it's just they never give you a single reason as to why it's true that everyone would experience pain in an entirely different subjective way. We would point out that the same chemical reactions and chemical biological processes are occurring. Maybe patients express that the pain is different, but we don't know what the objective reality is in their bodies. In fact, this topic suggests that it would probably be the same. The fact that one patient says it's a three and one person says it's a six it doesn't mean the pain is different, it just means that perhaps relative to the reference of experiences those patients have, that pain is different. But finally, we explain even if that's not true, we could obviously tailor this according to demographic groups or other important factors and our research would be likely to cater to it. 
The second claim is to say, well, the studies would be extremely bad, and therefore you would not be able to do so. But we explained to you that pain is a very big issue because everyone suffers from pain and really dislikes it, and many people suffer from incredibly bad chronic pain, which is exactly why, for the same reasons as huge amounts of research into things like cancer, there would now be huge amounts of research into pain. The differentiating factor is in the status quo, you can't do that research because there's no objective reality from which to do it. It's all subjective, but in our world, there would be objective ways to do so. You have to assume that feasibility, which explains why you would engage in that research. They say we just rely on Nazi science. No, we don't. Like, this is a stupid meme. The Nazis didn't use the scientific method. There was no real value that could be extracted from their insights. The fact that they tortured people did not help science at all. But secondly, they say we would only test on rich white people. Here are eight reasons that's unlikely. Firstly, we tell you that the FDA and other regulators are likely to demand when you put a medication forward that you have tested it on more than one group. They say the COVID vaccine was tested only on like one group of college students. Literally wrong. Like, I don't know what anti-vax website you got that piece of propaganda out of. But like multiple tests occurred in multiple countries, notably like Brazil had a very large test. Uh, like there were tests done in Africa and many other contexts for explicitly that reason. Secondly, we'd say that researchers and doctors often come from minority groups and often come from different cultural contexts and regions and therefore can do that research. And it's not in fact true that only like white countries can afford to do medical research or have medicine. Thirdly, we say that governments have very strong incentives to want to make sure that all of their voters, who literally vote them in, are able to gain the benefits of medical technology. Even if like, for example, there are many countries that have those minorities as a majority within them who would likely sponsor that research. Like countries like India or China might want to do research into how pain might operate on their particular population. Next, we point out that poorer countries are actually better at doing this research because it's easier to pay people because you need to pay them less because of the comparative difference between the value of currencies and the value of labor in those countries. So you're very likely to recruit large numbers of people from those contexts in the first place. And finally, we point out that there's incentives to novelty, which means that, for example, if there is an undetested minority group, that's a really easy way to differentiate yourself and make a mark in the scientific field, so you're likely to do so. Finally, Dan explains to you that aggregation and meta-analysis exist, which means that you're likely to get aggregation of data, you're likely to be able to update with bad studies, you're likely to be able to see which studies had good methods and which studies have bad methods, which responds to their claim that science will never update. Like, obviously scientists understand they're engaged in an iterative process, that's the point of the scientific method. No one believes we've like solved science and now we can just move on. We constantly get new knowledge about medicine and the way it works. We still have like very limited idea of, for example, the way the brain works, and no one would ever think to say that, oh, well, there's no need to do more studies in this particular area. Finally, we explained to you that obviously there would be a capacity to do things like try different medicines in the same class using our technology still, so you could still even get some level of differentiation there. The only harm they attach to all of this is just to say, well, on your side, everyone would just go to the street and self-medicate with cocaine or heroin. The reasons this is unlikely. Firstly, this is contingent on believing we're bad at prescribing. I think we've proved we're better. Secondly, how many people are willing to just go out onto the street and buy heroin? Seems very unlikely on their side. Like, maybe you're experiencing pain, maybe you want to do something, that seems like an extreme reaction. Compare that to on our side, where you're addicted to something like OxyContin and you have a chemical dependency, obviously makes you far more likely to seek out a drug that is chemically very similar to it, i.e. fentanyl, which is an opioid. But thirdly, we explain to you that just because you're under-medicated doesn't mean you're not medicated at all. You obviously have access to things like weaker drugs that obviously can provide you with some relief, and obviously there's a capacity to do things in those instances there. Which explains why it is very likely that we're able to get those benefits. Finally, they have a couple of weird attacks at all of the mechanisms we give to you as to why the opioid crisis is such a big problem on their side of the house. For example, they say it was only caused by bad studies, ignoring all of the other mechanisms we give to you and do not explain why it was the case that this was the only cause. Secondly, they say, well, we don't just use the pain scale. I've already responded to this. Thirdly, they say, well, some of these mechanisms only apply in the US. Yeah, 100,000 of those 200,000 deaths occurred in the US. It's the worst victim of the opioid crisis. We only get those ones. That's more than enough to win us this debate. We explain to you time and time again a series of complicated reasons as to why lobbying, pill mills, and the lack of enforcement capacity mean that every single year, 200,000 people die of opioid epidemic. And that it, that is by far the most important and the most concrete harm in the debate, which is exactly why it is a thing you must weigh over everything else. It is exactly the reason why Side Affirmative must be the team that wins this debate. It's why we're incredibly proud to affirm. I don't think that we have to believe 
that they are slightly better than the status quo in order to believe this de in order to believe that side affirmative uh, wins this debate. I think you have to believe that they are better than us. And our side, which is not the status quo, which was always different, which we've said down the bench, and it is better, which is why we're going to through to whatever the next final is. So I think there are a couple of things here. Uh, I'm going to make two quick observations at the start of the speech, which I think underpin our case, have never received a sufficient response. Uh, firstly, on uh, what this prescription process is going to look like. They tell you two things. You go to the doctor and as a patient, you're very pushy. And you push them to prescribe. You say, I want the strongest medication. I want the best thing. I want the most fun opioid. I think that this is you know, uh, unreasonable for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because drug seeking behavior happens on either side of the house. Because to the extent that you can go in and lie about how much pain you're in, you can go in and lie about your symptoms, saying, uh, I have really severe uh, period cramps or something. I have something really severe. And I think you can probably get at least some opioids on their side of the house. And I think that is quite uh, you know, quite damaging for their side. But the second thing is that obviously doctors are still going to check your symptoms. They're not going to say, oh, what is your uh, estimation of your disease and how much pain do you think you're in and which uh, op opioid are you going to like? They will say, uh, I have looked at your symptoms. You tell me that this is a really significant uh, pain, like experience of pain. I'm going to give you an anti-inflammatory because that was going to directly address your symptom and relieve your pain. So you should take like a amped up neurofen or something rather than a different kind of medication and then you will come back. They say well, it's going to take you months or maybe multiple months and think of all the drugs and think of all the chemicals that will be in your body in this time. Firstly, this is anti-scientific fear mongering but also if you're taking medication on their side, you're still having chemicals in your body and you're still having side effects if these are chronic conditions. You still take chemicals for a long time. Uh, it's just the same one. I don't think that changing medication is necessarily any worse. In fact, maybe you are lessened if you have different side effects on different medications. You don't have a persistent side effect that gets worse and worse and worse over time, you have less different ones to a lesser extent. But also, there is no reason that it needs to take a month. If you have an earache, you can rapidly tell whether the prescription painkiller is solving your earache as you will not have an earache anymore. They say some pain is resistant to uh, being treated. I think that that is actually just really insufficient. I think that that notion that you can't tell if you're still in pain and that giving you more painkillers isn't going to help. One, you can probably call your doctor and they can say, well, yes, we could up your dose a little bit because you're not at like a toxic threshold. Obviously, something Alyssa explained, we always got to keep on our side. Obviously, you're never going to be poisoned by your doctor in either, you know, hopefully in either world. But secondly, I think that it, it actually is often true that you can uh, solve pain by giving more pain medication. I think often people are incredibly conservative uh, about how much they want to give you. Often there are quite puritanical narratives of like, yeah, we prefer you weren't taking any drugs at all. But people who are experiencing horrible pain are the people you should care most about in this debate, particularly when that added to other stresses they experienced, particularly when they were in minorities, and they should be allowed to call their doctor and say, this isn't working, and not be told, sorry, you must be a medical miracle and there's absolutely nothing we can do to help you. But secondly, really quickly, why you should believe, believe that pain is different for different people. Firstly, because obviously, look around, we are all somewhat different. We all have different bodies. We all have slightly different chemical makeups. Our brain, our neurochemistry is all a bit different to the extent they want to tell you that this is all in the mind. But secondly, because the same process obviously just can cause different levels of pain and it doesn't matter that it was the same things happening. Because uh, every woman who gave birth was experiencing the same process of pushing a baby out, but some women found it much more difficult than others. And that was what you should care about. The subjective experience of pain is the most important thing because that is what ruins your quality of life. That is what makes you depressed. That is what makes chronic conditions a massive cause of like incredible mental health problems because you were in so much pain, because you were suffering all the time. Even if it is all in the mind, I think that is okay. We want to remedy it. We want to get it out of your mind. We want to allow you to live a good and happy life. I'm going to talk about the opioid crisis really quickly. I think that there are, apart from the fact that I don't think they're particularly reliable on opioids because they tell you you're going to go and buy, like, you know, that on our side you buy heroin, which is an opioid. Uh, but beyond their credibility and, like, my attack on it, I think there are a couple of reasons this isn't true. A significant part of the opioid crisis is because people were not being prescribed painkillers properly. That is, they tried a, a very strong opioid, probably something that we wouldn't have immediately prescribed. We would have given them something smaller, something weaker, because that just seems, like, in a doctor's interest not to immediately hand things out to a potentially drug-seeking patient. Of course, we're going to say, try not producing for your pain before we say, oh, well, would you like some, you know, some fentanyl? Uh, but I think that it's quite reasonable to believe, like, you know, the empirical source of the hundreds of, th of the hundred thousand deaths in America is because people got cut off because the doctor said, your pain should be solved now. Uh, we can't give you anything stronger. Your pain is fixed and you shouldn't be taking drugs for more than a month, even though uh, maybe your chronic pain condition is going to last the rest of your life. And so people went and bought uh, bad pills that were being imported that had fentanyl in them. And then they 
they died immediately of overdoses. These overdoses aren't coming from people overdosing on the prescription medication they got. They're coming from people buying another opioid, heroin, on the streets because they are in excruciating pain, because their lives are made so miserable, because doctors will not listen to them and will not believe them. But they say, okay, well, lobbying is going to mean that these are prescribed badly. I don't think that it's reasonable to say that just because in America there are like problems with the medical lobby which are actually being cracked down upon because of the opioid crisis, we shouldn't consider every other country. Because I don't think it's fair to tell people in Australia that you should weigh the fact that like, you know, uh, we shouldn't listen, you know, you should weigh the fact that some people in America die because doctors might immediately want to prescribe them a Sackler opioid against the fact that they are in excruciating pain, that they have a long-term chronic condition, that their lives are still being ruined. I think that that is insufficient, but obviously our side, where we actually address people's pain consistently, made them less likely to do drug seeking, made them less likely to buy dangerous pills, made them more likely to be safely treated and monitored by a doctor because they weren't going underground because of how sick they were. But now on diverse populations. I think this is where we hit this debate out of the park. We tell you a couple of things are in under this idea. Firstly, we say that studies are often bad. There are five reasons. <coughs> Firstly, it is empirically true that these stuff studies are often bad because we do use uh, medical research that was done on, for example, slaves. Even if you think that some Nazi science has been ruled out, we still use medical research that was done on prisoners of war, who obviously had like specific demographics about them that made them not representative of the whole population. But I think there are structural reasons, my favourite kind uh, of reason, that you should believe that this is true as well. Firstly, because often these studies on their side are still going to make conservative estimates, even if they do new ones, because you don't want to over-prescribe. They tell you that is so bad. You'll probably go for the lowest level of the range when you say, this is how many pills you should give someone. You don't want it because medic uh, doctors don't want to be giving out extra drugs. Secondly, because you can't get that much diversity because a lot of this research just is done on people who sign up as willing participants, and those are likely to be university students who want to get remunerated for their time. Thirdly, because this isn't very exciting research, because like Alyssa told you, if you are a doctor and you could be studying a new cancer drug, or you could be studying, like, wait, what was the specific effect of paracetamol on Japanese women? Like, I think that is much less exciting. But fourthly, because it, uh, uh, there are also other narratives that exist uh, that would always interact with that, like the thing about how women are told that they should suffer the pain of pregnancy because that is part of their biological destiny. They say, meta-analysis is a really cool and fun thing to do as a scientist and does exist. And secondly, this provides a new impetus to it. I think, one, the impetus that exists is only because now you can't ask a patient how much pain they're in, so you have to do really good research to try and identify how much pain they will be in. We just ask them, are you still in pain? Has this medication worked? Has it fixed your pain? But secondly, I think that like uh, you would have to do a huge number of these new studies in order to get the benefits they claim. But they say, our side is actually worse on this issue of diverse populations because people are likely to still have bias towards my, oh my god, my phone has just died. Um, could I see a timer? Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, because people are likely to have bias towards people who they don't want to listen to because they were women, because they were people of colour. One, this is really mitigatory. I think we still get some benefit, even if you think people are particularly racist or sexist. Secondly, there is an existing trend of increased diversity and equity training within doctors about how they should interact with patients that doesn't necessarily scale up to the level of studies. But thirdly, because if they get to assume feasibility, we do too. But let's assume that that feasibility cuts both ways. I think assuming that these studies are really, really are done really well and our pain scale is slightly better, I think that there is a still harm there is still a significant harm to the people who are going to get, um, who have individual differences between their pain. Even if you don't think that happens on a minority level, I think that individual people who experience pain differently, even though they were both white women or something, still got a significant benefit on our side. I'm incredibly proud to oppose. <laughs>